So I'm going to talk about why working from home will stick. Uh, this is joint work with Jose Barrero from Midtown and Steve Davis from Chicago. Uh, you know, the question is, why are we interested in this? Well, I've personally been working on working from home, going back to a survey. The first survey I ever did on it was in 2004. So it's been a long interest. And, you know, not many people are very interested in working from home. But as you can imagine, that all changed pretty rapidly in March of 2020. So since March of 2020, over the last kind of almost year and a half, I've been collecting a huge amount of data, which I'll talk through today, but also talk to more than 100 plus organizations, a lot of firms, but hospitals, uh, judiciary, uh, you know, Palo Alto, my local city council, a research lab, all kinds of stuff. So I'll go through in the next 10 minutes kind of what we know on working from home and why it will stick. So firstly, today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, basically evidence based on a survey of 5,000 Americans we've been surveying per month going back to May of last year. So initially, two and a half thousand a month, but in the last few months, we've been doing 5,000. It's an online survey. It takes about 10 minutes. We pay people to do it. It's pretty straightforward. It's a bunch of questions. You can see some examples here. How often are you working from home? Demographics, what do you see the future doing? What's your firm told you? We take that and re-weight re it to match the American population at age 20 to 64. So you can think of this in a sense as a, as a survey of working age Americans, the US labor force. So first fact is working from home, not surprisingly, has exploded. So before the pandemic, we know from the American Time Use Survey, a very uh, high quality accurate survey run by the BLS, a module in 2017 and 2018, that about 5% of full work paid working days were from home. So one in 20 working days in the US before the pandemic were at home, 19 out of 20 times people commuted to their business premises. During the pandemic, that has gone up tenfold. So 50% of people, or sorry, 50% of working days are from home. That generally came about primarily from about half of people working 100% of days, me, probably most people listening to this, I suspect, were full-time working from home since these are primarily university graduates. And then 50% of Americans were either not working or um, were working on the business premises. And then finally, post-pandemic, we see this is going to drop to about 20%. So post-pandemic, about 20% of days are going to be worked uh, from home and about 80% from the business premises. You can think about this in a very simple way, which is, roughly half of Americans can't work from home. So they tend to be people in more frontline uh, service jobs, manufacturing, healthcare, people who need to work with customers, work with equipment, have to go in to the business premises. They've been doing that for the last year uh, if they've kept their jobs and they are going to continue working on the business premises every day into the future. The other half of the US labor force Typically, college grads tend to typically have higher paid jobs. They're managers, they're professionals, they're more senior jobs. They can typically work remotely. During the pandemic, they have been working remotely five days a week. That's the 50% number that's been running. It still is kind of now, it's about to end. Post pandemic, the average plan they've been told is they're going to be working from home two days a week come into the office three days a week. So this, this has been called the hybrid mode. You've probably heard all about, well, this is by far the most common plan. You know, thousands upon thousands of people we're interviewing are telling us if they are graduates, if they're in that typically that better paid half of the labor force that can work from home, they're currently full-time post-pandemic, they're gonna be working from home two days a week. And you know, if, if you've opened a single newspaper or gone online, you've probably seen this, you know, Citigroup announced hybrid, Microsoft announced hybrid, Deutsche Bank announced hybrid, Google announced hybrid, JP Morgan announced hybrid. I could just go on and on and on, you know. So from talking to firms, uh, I hear that something like 70 to 80% of firms that have made plans post-COVID for their graduates are talking about hybrid. So normally three days in the office, two days at home. So why is this? Why is working from home sticking? This is really the core of this paper. Why do we go from 5% pre-pandemic to 20% post, why didn't we go back to 5%? So there are five key drivers of why working from home is gonna stick, and I'll go through them now. So driver number one is what I call forced experimentation. You know, working from home under the pandemic was for many people a horrible, you know, terrible experiment. It was something that, you know, almost no employer, I mean, no employer I've spoken to 
wanted, but it's turned out actually against expectations to work incredibly well. So he asked his question relative to expectations, how has working from home turned out? We've shortened the answers, but they're in terms of efficiency, which you can think of, you know, as a kind of layman's term for productivity. Uh, you can see that the overwhelming majority of respondents to the survey, so over 60% report it's more efficient than expected, and a little over 10% reported less efficient than expected. I have run similar surveys of firms and you get the similar story. So, you know, against expectations, I don't know about people listening have the same view, but certainly for me, I wouldn't say it's perfect. You know, I prefer being in the office at least, you know, three days a week and seeing my colleagues. I miss my colleagues, but, you know, it's a lot better than I thought it would have been at least working from home. And so it's turned out it isn't as bad as people thought. And as a result, a lot of people are going to stick with this. You know, driver two for sticking is that there's been a massive investment in uh, equipment and time, think of it as intangible capital in terms of working from home. So in our survey, I asked two questions. First on how many hours you've invested in learning to work from home effectively. So thinking, you know, me personally, like how I, figuring out all the little buttons and extras on Zoom, on Teams, on GoToMeetings, on WebEx, you know, all the different stuff that people are using, uh, getting my you know, office set up behind me. I don't know if you can see, but there are you know, pictures on the wall that didn't used to be there. I, you know, but also spending money. I bought a proper, uh, you know, a, a microphone and a webcam because the laptop I'm using didn't, I mean, it was pretty awful. Uh, I actually bought a desk that lowers and raises because I find it easier to stand up at times. I bought a swivelly off it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns out that on average, Americans have spent about 1.2% of GDP in terms of expenditure and time getting themselves able to work from home. That's obviously a lot of money. That's on the household side. We can also look at the firm side. It turns out during the pandemic, uh, and you know, Jan Eberle actually talked explicitly about this at Jackson Hole. During the pandemic, there has been a big drop in investment by US firms, but one subcomponent of that has risen, which is this private investment in information processing equipment and software. So it's not just households have had a huge explosion uh, to make working from home possible, but firms as well as on, you know, on the company side. So this investment is sunk and it's gonna mean we're better able to work from home post pandemic. Fact three, there has been a massive reduction in negative stigma around working from home. Um, you know, collecting data on this is hard, you know, collecting data on stigma and perceptions is never that easy, but I, you know, I, I honestly not met anyone that disagrees with this perception, which is on our survey, we asked how have changes in working from home perceptions changed among so changed amongst people you know and again you can see something like 60 percent have said they've improved about 30 percent have said they've said the same and about 10 percent said they've got worse so again the overwhelming majority of people claim you know you when i used to work on working from home, going back to 2004 people would talk about working from home shirking from home or they'd say you know working remotely remotely working was seen as very negative uh, you know, the joke was the three great enemies of working from home are the bed, the fridge, and the television. All of this was very negative. Now that stuff's kind of vaporized because everyone from CEOs downwards are working from home. And, you know, it's not seen as, I mean, it's just seen much more positively. I'll give you a, a very non-quantitative way to show this as well, which is this is a screenshot of a image search of the word working from home I took in March 2013. So I went to give a talk in Microsoft. And obviously it being Microsoft, they used Bing. So I took a, just a screenshot of Bing and I took a photo and used it in my slides just to show how bad the stigma around working from home was. Because if you look at this, there are, uh, I think there are maybe 19 pictures here and they're terrible. They're like naked people, cartoons, people juggling babies, very negative uh, images. If you look at the similar search terms that get pulled up, working from home funny, working from comics, working from underwear, working from, I mean, it's just really, really negative stigma. You forward this to, this is the same search uh, on being in 2021, so what, eight years later, and it's dramatically better. If you look at the similar search words, working from home office, okay, funny is still there, but desk opportunities, making money, et cetera. So this is a much, much more positive uh, image. The, you know, the negative stigma about working from home is dramatically reduced, if not gone away. So fourth factor is, there appears to be pretty major residual fear of proximity to other people. So, you know, it's hard to say why maybe we've 
who watched too many of those horrifying sneeze videos to you know, ever want to get into a crowded subway or into an elevator, I guess, as I'd say, it would say in Britain, a lift. But we asked this question after a vaccine arrives, um, I, you know, how much would you return to pre-COVID activities? This question has been updated you know, now once you've been vaccinated. But it's the same sense of once you've all been vaccinated, what would you feel comfortable going back to doing? And you see that only 28% of people report, at least to us, they'd be completely comfortable uh, going back to pre-COVID activities. 72% say they'd feel uncomfortable with at least the subway or crowded elevators. You know, interestingly enough, I've done a lot of you know, exec ed on this. I gave, uh, um, you know, for Marcus's uh, seminar in, in, at Princeton, he used this question and polled on his Zoom and exec ed. You get very similar things in, you know, polling exec eds, polling academic economists as you get from the general public on this. I've done this survey in the UK, very similar numbers. You may think that people a year or two from now forget about this. It's quite possible. So these, you know, people may be hyped up now. They may kind of move on. I, you know, having said that, if you look at the flight data after 9-11, it took three years for air flights to return to their 9-11 level. Of course, 9-11 was at that point an upward trend. So it took, you know, six years to get close to pre-trend. So and 9-11 was uh, in some ways less impactful on, you know, mass uh, psyche as, as COVID and the pandemic has been. So I suspect at least a substantial number of people are going to be nervous about density and it's going to make it hard for employers to pack people back into offices. And indeed, from talking to a lot of companies, they are very concerned, particularly companies that have property and high rises that they ever manage to get people back at the density levels they will pre-pandemic and working from home is one solution to that. Then finally, um, redirected technical change. There's a very long history in economics about how technology you know, has changes in the rate and direction. There's a whole program in the Productivity and Innovation Entrepreneurship Program on the rate and direction of technology. Here's a great example of this, which is the pandemic has tilted technological innovation increasingly towards working from home. So with uh, Steve Davis, newly assessed COVA, we have a, another paper that looks at the share of patent applications that mention remote working. And you can see, of course, after the pandemic starts, this thing starts going up. Maybe you know, it starts in February, but of course the lockdown happened in uh, China at the end of the year before. As we updated the data, you can see this thing going up and up. Again, it's not surprising. I've talked to a large number of tech firms and they are throwing enormous amounts of money. In fact, talking to you know, hardware firms, talk to Logitech, talk to um, Intel, et cetera, they are throwing enormous amounts of money at technologies that are going to facilitate working from home because of course the market is dramatically increased so going from five to twenty percent your market's gone up 4x investments exploded and therefore it makes more sense for firms to invest in it as a result working from home 10 20 years from now is going to be way better and way easier than it was 20 years ago so if i think back to when i first started working on this in 2004 there was no video conferencing on the internet skype was 2003 is still pretty rudimentary there was no file sharing, there was no cloud, Dropbox, the cloud were kind of late 2000s. So that's a very different era. Already, uh, you know, now we you know, communicate by video conferences, we share files, we share presentations all the time. You know, 10, 20 years from now, I assume technology is going to improve further. Maybe there'll be fantastic virtual reality. You know, it's hard to say what it will be, but working from home will become increasingly similar to, I think, in person's work. So what about the implications for society? They're mostly good, they're two good things, and one thing I kind of worry about. Good news one is uh, post-pandemic hybrid is gonna be beneficial to most employees. So I mentioned that most firms, particularly for graduates, are planning to have people work from home on average two days a week, come into the office three days a week. We asked people what they thought of that, and the, you know, the bottom answer is most people like that. Most, you know, pretty much everyone likes that, better than you know, five days a week in the office. And they, on average, people say that's equivalent to something like a 7% pay increase. In fact, that's very similar to a paper in MBR working paper by Alex Mass and Mandy Pillay on previous research and working from home found people valued that at equivalent to about an 8% pay increase. So this perk that roughly half, as in the graduate half of the workforce are gonna get, seen as very valuable, equivalent to you know, a pension plan or a kind of mean healthcare plan if you think of 7% of pay. Good news too, um, working from home, probably at least hybrid. So that people, you know, just to be clear, working from home two days a week in the office, three days a week, 
should probably increase productivity by about 5%. Roughly three of that 5% comes from saved commuting time. The average American commutes about an hour a day. In our survey they report, they see about half of that time as wasted time. The other half roughly, you know, you can imagine people listen to podcasts or read, but certainly that's a fair amount of wasted time each week that you can save by working from home. The other 2% comes from, you know, this is evidence going back over, you know, work I've done before in previous MBR work actually on, on a randomized control trial out in China, that it is quieter working from home. It turns out working from home, once the kids have gone back to school, uh, on average is more efficient because it's quieter. What about the bad news? I think the one piece of bad news for me is it could raise equity concerns. So what I've done here is I've plotted, again, from our, from our MBR paper with Barrera and Davis, on the y-axis is the number of paid days post-COVID and on the x-axis annual earnings. And the black circles here are what employees want, so what they tell us they're like. You've noticed pretty much everyone wants to work from home on average for about two to two and a half days a week. Some people want more, somewhat less, but by income level, it averages out pretty flat at about two. In terms of what they say their employers are gonna give them is very upward sloping. So folks down here, they're low paid, they tend to be frontline jobs, they tend to be you know, face to face, the task they do. I mean, this is relate, very much related to Dingle and Neiman's work. You have to go into the off, you have to go into the factory or the shop to be there, so you can't really work from home. If you look at high end folks, you know, high paid grads, managers, professionals, they tend to be able to work from home. And so their employers have said, you know, you guys on average, you, can, you are going to get to work from home two days a week. So in a sense, this is a perk, but it does raise an equity issue because the very group that's had the worst pandemic, those that had to come into the workplace throughout the last year, because they have to be there, you know, lower paid workers, a post pandemic also not going to get this nice perk, the higher paid university graduates are. And, you know, from talking to firms, this comes up all the time as an equity issue and a managerial issue. And I think it's also an, an important political issue. So to conclude, um, working from home, you know, it's gone from 5% pre-pandemic, pretty low. In fact, only 15% of people ever work from home pre-pandemic. So it's not only low, it's rare. To 60%, 56% at its peak during COVID when in the majority of working days in the, the US were, were at home. There's something like 20% post-pandemic. To give you a sense, by the way, of how long it would have taken, pre-pandemic working from home is roughly doubling every 12 years. So the pandemic has generated about a quarter of a century's worth of growth of working from home in basically kind of two years. Um, you know, there are a number of mechanisms behind the shift. I think, it, you know, as we say, again, it's partly stick. I think it has huge positive implications for work from productivity, but I do worry about the kind of equity implications of it. With that, I'll stop. And so if you're interested in further details, uh, it's in the MBL working paper. Thank you for listening.